Okay, let's start this thing. So today, I would like to cover RSA encryption. The beautiful part about RSA encryption is how stupidly simple it is to encrypt and decrypt data. It, it's actually, you're, you're going to be shocked here. So, encryption, decryption. Here it is. Modular exponentiation. Good lecture, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so, I take, uh, and I guess I need to add, so I, I was trying to make up uh, some numbers here. So, I have, uh, so, so N is this modulus, right? Everything we're going to do is modulo N, and N, N is this value we're going to pick out here. So, I'm going to pick, I, I, I'm, I'm writing Python. I, I don't feel good about this, but that's uh, that's where I'm at. So, uh, big. Uh, I, I need I need working big num, the high performance big num arithmetic. So this is how I'm getting there. <laughs> it, it makes me feel dirty. But, and I'm having to learn another language. I mean, it's like no, I learned it really. I'm really confused with like. I'm 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 proud that uh, oh, yeah. never seen this from him. I wrote that whole line pretty much myself. <laughs> I just copied that from the web. So that's, that's more Python than I've ever written in my life. I think. Uh, right. So, so, so here's the deal. We need numbers where we can raise, we can do this exponentiation thing. So, so, maybe, so, so the, the way you encrypt a message is you take the message that is treated as a number and you raise it to this encryption exponent. But default, the encryption exponent pretty much everybody uses 65,300. 65,537. This is uh, 64k plus one. And the, the reason everybody can use the same one is because this, this part is public. And it's the same for everything. Right? So that's how we hear it. It's surprisingly, it seems like, how can this possibly keep a message secret? Oh uh, yeah, that was a mod, mod n. Yeah, and and uh, actually, this question of what should n be? Should it be a prime? There's primes involved. So we'll, yeah, that's what we'll say. So we have this exponent n, and and the deal is, yeah, it, uh, we don't really know what the message is. Uh, so once it's exponentiated and then wrapped around n, and then of course, you know, you raise anything to sixty-five thousandth power, it's getting really big. We wrap it around, and then it, the, so hope number one is that uh, wrap around n is hopefully going to be kind of hard to predict. It means we seem to actually get there. So so, so we have some requirements on N, right? Uh, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, uh, let's see, so, so message raised to the E. I have an encrypted message now. And then I raise it to another power E. And that's supposed to decrypt it. Did it work? No. So my message, and it's because I just randomly made up these to N. So it, it turns out, so, so how would we find an N and a D that would work? I mean, we can just sort of, so we can start trying that. How about E, E? No, how about uh, E, A? And are these, uh, yeah, okay, so we're getting different numbers there. At some point, are we going to get back to this message, or are we just going to, like, is, is this even plausible that, uh, that the following could be? Right, wait, let's start with a message. We raise it first to the E power, to encrypt it, then to the D power, and we're going to end up back at the original message. So, no way. I mean, if message is not one, I mean, anything we do is, is, is going to just go off and this is going to be some huge number. Except, this is all mod n. So, right, modular arithmetic, eventually it's guaranteed wrap around. So, what's an example of like uh, how we could make sure that E to the D... So, so what we want is we want basically First to the e power, then to the d power. It's equivalent to saying e times d is the way exponentiation works. Uh, so we want we want this essentially to be equivalent to multiplying by one. Right. That, that's the first power. Then we're okay. Right? When when is e times d to be going to be equivalent to the first power? Well, yeah. Yeah. So, so when I was, if e times d mod n is one and n's a prime, this works great. So one way to do this is pick n to be a prime. We know what e is. e is 64k plus 1. Pick a number. We run the modular inverse algorithm to compute d. 
Now we have our decryption algorithm. We have our decryption. What's the problem with this? No, it's, 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 we, we saw last time modular inverse is this the extended uh, Euclidean algorithm, and oh, yeah, there's a little snippet of Python to do. It. So it so, so, sounds legit, right? So we've got uh, somewhere. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> Uh, see, the yeah, so, 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 uh, yeah. Everybody knows what E is. That's true. So we get one of the three is is known. Uh, do we have to tell people n? Well, for them to do n to the e mod n, they kind of got to know n. And n has to be public. That's fine. So that's that's kind of scary. Well, d d we can keep secret. Except wait a sec. If there's an efficient algorithm to take e. And N and figure out D, we can't keep it secret for long. Well, shoot. Why does anybody use this RSA encryption stuff? <laughs> so it turns out they don't use N prime. Because I mean you can you can set it up so that we can you know basically encrypt a message to get back. So let me let me paste in some code. Lots of goes, goes, goes. Here we get uh, all right. All so I need the I need modular inverses, and I'm gonna need a, a way to find prime so that that's all this garbage here. So I'm gonna just paste that. Okay, so I need I need a way to find big prime. So I'm gonna just I'm gonna do that right here. Uh, let's see, find a prime. prime. If I can remember what I call the function, you'll see more of this than you care about. Random underscore prime. Number of bits, so I, I just want a tiny one. 32 bit prime. Maybe, heck, I'm going to start with a. Yeah, the 32 bits is going to fit the message has to fit in the uh, in prime. Okay, what what is my uh, what is my decryption exponent? Well, it's just got to be the modular inverse of e mod n. So I'm, I, I got my modulus, I got my exponent, this is my private key. It's not very private, but. Uh, E, there we are. And now hopefully I raised up first to the E, then to the D, all of its mod N, and then we should wrap it around again. Yeah, miserably. Really I would have tested this out before. I wonder if my message is too so if my message is too long, I can't it won't actually fit. We got wrapped around right up there. So I think I actually need a I think I need a Figuring out uh, I want to know that thing. It's at least even and such. <laughs> I, I yeah, see. I had messed this up before. Oh. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so we have to pick the right ends and D's. But I should I'm gonna save and copy that because uh, it work. So, so the problem is. Uh, We have to pick an entity such that A, they work, and I thought that was going to be easier than that. Uh, and B, they're hard to guess. So we've actually failed on both counts here. Uh, so, so, so something like this module inverse. Uh, right. So how else could we do this? Well, gosh, uh, I mean, that, that was uh, that, that's kind of embarrassing. Uh, you can you can actually generate RSA keys. So, for example, gen RSA. So I can say, hey, open SSL, generate me a key. And I'm gonna I'm gonna cheat here. I'm gonna say, generate me a key. 
Very big key with only 32 bits, so 32 bit key, and it uh, it happened pretty fast, so, so, so it can it can, uh, it can do that pretty easy. And I'm just going to dump out the key. It turns out it's modulus, so this is n. Is uh, show you that number? Oh, I couldn't generate any prime there. Let's see. So I'm I'm going to just use their values here. Whole, uh, let's see, the, public exponent, the private exponent is uh, that number, and and th this is actually not quite the modular universe. Actually, it's uh, it's designed to be hard to find a, uh, a decryption exponent that works. So let's see. So if I pick the right n and d, hopefully. Oh, Actually, there, there, there are no. Yeah, I'm, I'm printing it. Oh, for private exponent is D. But there's actually no point in printing them because they're both hard coded. So yeah. Uh, so so the way this sucker is supposed to work. Uh, let's see. So okay. So so pick these these random integers, right? N and D. Now the uh, the hard part about this is. Uh, and it's supposed to be hard to do. So everybody knows n, everybody knows e, and they just it's supposed to be hard to pick e. That's hard for them to guess e, like to come up with that value. So where where does this come from? Well, it's it's a little bit weird, actually. Yeah. Why, question. Why is e yeah. Uh, so if n is prime, it's supposed to be really easy to guess e. Where do we come from? Or a somehow screwed up the calculation. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so uh, n. You that n. What do you notice about this n? Uh, uh, the n is the number of bits. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing. Big. Big number. It's odd, which means prime. <laughs> there are apparently some other properties of prime. <laughs> so, right. First order number one is prime. Three. Five prime. So this is obvious. Checks out. Checks out. Might need that good stuff. So uh, right. So so it turns out that this number is in fact not uh, not prime. Let's see, action properties. Yeah, there there are none listed. So uh, right, so, so, so the deal is uh, that uh, that that crazy number, which unfortunately I have just uh, here we are. So so it turns out this number is the product of prime, just and neither of them is a small product like two. So uh, yeah, so, so here's the weird part about doing this. So you can ask OpenSSL to generate you some bigger primes, and it turns out so some, something secure is like 1024 bits, for example. And uh, primes, so the product of two primes, or the product is about 1024 bits long, is just about beyond our ability to factor. So RSA back in the gosh, back in the 80s. So, so, so this algorithm actually comes from about the 1970s. RSA back in the 80s published a series of cash prizes, the RSA numbers, and uh, saying like, this is the RSA factoring challenge, uh, let's see, I guess 91, saying, uh, hey, you know, factor these numbers, we will give you big cash prizes, right? And uh, let's see, they stopped offering the money, but the, the numbers are still out there, and people have still been, been trying, right? So they were like, we will pay you 10 grand if you can factor this 576 bits, you know, product of two, of two big prizes. And uh, basically, some of these were one that they sort of stopped uh, stopped paying off. Uh, they did so. This was actually kind of famous. They factored RSA seven uh, seven hundred sixty eight. So let me show you the numbers here. Um, that apparently is not prime. Although boy, it looks like uh, it's the product of these two, which are in fact prime. So calculating this was uh, the equivalent of about two thousand on a modern modern machine. So, yeah, and, and no one has actually factored, uh, but publicly admitted to factoring any of the larger RSA uh, RSA numbers. So this is, this is a little bit surprising, right? That as you have you have this number. It's, so the deal is, I can have these multiplied in Python 
more or less instantaneously, right? That's uh, the use for the Python, big num, very easy. I need nothing but Python. Cool. I can say, hey, print me at a number. That's a big number. That and we get one two three oh one eight six one two three oh one eight six six yada 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 yada. <laughs> Multiplication is really cheap. Multiplication of two big primes is really cheap. The hard problem here is factoring a number into the product of its original value. We again, uh, sure algorithm right, on a quantum computer can do this in you know uh, any few times. Right? So pretty reasonable time for some good numbers. We, uh, th th there are some really cool, crazy, uh, uh, turns out uh, there are looking for based algorithms to do factoring. Uh, but uh, they're, they're, in fact, uh, the, the reason we can factor seven or 68 bit numbers is because they did not try all two to the you know, 300 uh, factors. Yeah, it's, uh, the, the thing is, there's just too many times to, to just do this by brute force. The brute force, you'd expect this to, uh, you could crack, crack maybe a, uh, a hundred bit long product because you know you're checking two to fifty of the products under there. That's you know that's maybe semi of the probability. They have much better algorithms for this, and it turns out so. So this is the reason why there's uh, you know, we're using like thousand bit, two thousand bit uh, RSA encryption is because we're better at factoring you know, those. Uh, they're better known algorithms than brute force, but they're still exponentially slow. Right? So. Uh, if, if you just scroll up in the list, right? So it's, it's something like 2,000 years to factor the 768 number, and like the you know the ones that were cracked uh, a long time ago, like uh, you know 500 some bit numbers. See, it was 8,000 MIPS years back in back in 1999. MIPS was MIPS was the fastest machine of the day. But it sort of a backronym for millions of instructions per second, which they thought was sounded pretty cool. Uh, see. So, so a, a lot of these are sort of the modern. The modern version is like hours. Yeah. 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 So, so the modern version would be bits, which just doesn't sound like. So, yeah. uh, billions or trillions of the tips. Tips. Uh, see. So, so in, in 1994, they won 100 bucks. Woohoo! Right for factoring this 400 bit number. Right. So, so in other words. From basically in the 90s, some kids getting together and you know we're putting together a couple of you know, computers or something over the internet, wow. <laughs> and winning a hundred dollars, which was worth like two hundred dollars at the time, right? Uh, that uh, yeah, it, it just wasn't. It's, it's so it's not really that much computing, right? To factor a 400 bit number with modern you know, the multiple volume of whatever XC algorithms, etc. Right? Uh, but like you double the size of the number, and it gets a lot harder because Exponential, uh, increase. No one has ever factored the thousand bit, you know, uh, RSA. So they gave RSA numbers for like thousand bits. Right, there it is. There, there's this number, right? And uh, somebody could check by just multiplying the two products. Uh, it's it's getting to be within the realm of possibility to factor a thousand bit product, right? So, which means that hey, okay, right, we're, we're probably pretty pretty much okay. Uh, and and if, if you if you care about security, right, 2,000 bits, and now we're you know, uncertain. Or that. You, you, could, you could say this about anything, right? It's, it's not known whether NSA can transmute lead to gold. But, but, but right now, right, 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 they say the government has deprecated that form. Yeah. So they're like, well, right, it's know. just the writing on the wall, right? 768 falls. You don't say, well, 1024 should be fine until it's not. And you don't want to have like you know all this stuff relying on many different times. So if you look at like my connection to Wikipedia, so this is HTTPS. You, you know you can just keep clicking here on the like show me my connection info, show me certificate info, show me the details on this thing. The second show algorithm is RSA encryption, right? Uh, I think we said this out before. Uses used to hash. The algorithm is RSA encryption. The public key has a modulus of 2048 bits, right? More than 1024 bits because they they kind of care. This modulus, this is the number. This is the n, right? That, uh, that we basically wrap around again. There's the exponent in hex. It's one o o o one. It's like four k plus one. So that's so that that's the exponent. What is the d, right? The d is derived from this n somehow. Right? 
And if we could factor that DE, we could essentially the trivial to come up with the, uh, the, the D again. I don't know what the D is. Where is the D? It's on the Wikipedia server. And uh, the, the Wikipedia server can now decrypt messages I send to it, and only the Wikipedia server can, or somebody that's not in and copy the D. So, so the beautiful trick about this thing is I can make up some big prime number. I can take the prime, so we're going to see how, how, this, how, how, this, how this works. I can, I can, I can basically do this this operation that where uh, uh, I've got, I know, I know what the primes are. I can figure out some special thing. It's actually oh, there's a whole numerics that lets uh, that lets this uh, decrypt message, and uh, no one else can figure that that out. As far as we know. The best way to you know figure this out is to is to like uh, factor this number. I, unfortunately, again, there's tons of things that are not known. Is it as hard? Is there some uh, tr workaround where we don't have to factor this number? We can just run some modular you know, something or other. To calculate the D, we have no idea. Is it really that hard to factor numbers? We have no idea. Seems to be, <laughs> as far as we can tell. So right. So so, so the way this works. I'm going to make two no, two primes, P and Q. So P is going to be a random prime. I'm going to make it, uh, I don't know how to do this. It's 128 bits. It's not really big enough at all. But, uh, so let's take a show. It's small enough to actually see the two numbers on the screen. So so I get two numbers, P and Q. Hopefully, hopefully they're two different random primes. So N is just the product. Uh, P times Q. This seems like a serious hole. That's, uh, that's, that's what we got. Uh, D turns out to be the modular inverse of uh, let's see of the E mod P minus one times Q minus one. This is actually the big advantage. If I know what P and Q are, I can subtract one. Surprisingly, simple. So I've got my modulus, got my private exponent. And let's try this. This works. So my, my modulus is n, which is this crazy huge. That's still too big. I'm going to cut my uh, short code. We're going to be down to a 32-bit prime, four billion and change. So this is going to be trivially uh, easy factor. So clearly, I mean, you can look at that. <laughs> Anybody see what the factors are? Does anyone happen to have the quadratic number C field uh, in, their, in their head? Yeah, I mean, either. Uh, so, yeah, so, so we, we can calculate the decryption X1 from them. So, right, so, so basically you, you, you run the numbers. So, so here, here's how this actually works. We might do a random prime of 512 bits, another random prime of about 512 bits. I'm going to print them out just uh, so, it works, so we can see what they are. So here's the prime. So they are P, P, and they are Q. So I got P and Q. They're 500 bit numbers. I mean, <laughs> it's just, it's just, uh, it just keeps going and going. So P, Q, there's the product of P and Q. There's the decryption exponent. Here's the encrypted message, which is just goblin cook. And then there's the decryption message, which apparently decrypted properly. Any questions? There's a wide variety of problems with that. Uh, uh, yeah. So, so, uh, so, so, so typically, you use the key. So, so the, the key is used to encrypt like uh, is a perfectly legit way to do. So you, you might, we might actually have like the. Uh, so when we're doing HPS, we would have. Uh, so, so somebody, for example, at uh, Global Sign. Or let, let, let's start the root. Yeah. Every web browser on the planet basically has a has a root certificate from Global Sign that says like, hey, this guy, is, this is these are Global Sign folks, right? They uh, they have this public key. Right? There's there's their modulus. You want to encrypt messages for Global Sign? That's uh, that's it. And in fact, uh, right, so there, there we are. And uh, yeah, so so let's uh, go on. So again, everything is public except this. So, so the, 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 uh, the product of the primes is public, which seems really scary, right? You're just saying, like, here's the product, two big primes. 
if you can factor it, then it's game over, right? It's like one line of code. So, two, two important questions here, right? One is, uh, why does this work? Right, so, so somehow we want m to the e times the e to be equivalent to 1. Now, we saw if it's equal to a prime, but it's supposedly a be wrong. So what I want is I want m, m to the e times the e. It's not going to be mod of prime anymore. This is going to be mod p times q. And what I've picked is I've picked e times d. What's e times d? Well, it's, uh, we, we, we picked it, right? So, and it's the, so, the d, d, d times d is 1 mod p minus 1 times d. Where is this? But, but mod n would sort of make more sense, and that, that I think that would work if, if n is prime. Uh, so, so, so the trick, e times d, well, e times d, it's equal to 1 mod p minus, uh, p minus 1 p minus 1. Why does this make this happen? We're not operating mod p minus 1 p minus 1. We're, we're operating mod n. So, so, so we've seen exponentials, right? Uh, and exponentials have lots of these sort of well-known mathematical properties. In particular, uh, Gauss, the uh, Euler, yeah, uh, Euler. Uh, so, one of the famous theorems from Euler in the 1700s, uh, Euler's theorem, named after him. Uh, it's, it's this crazy thing, and this is a little bit. It seems a little bit counterintuitive. So there's going to be a brief, uh, brief digression to totions. So a, a totient is uh, a totient is this crazy thing by n to count as the numbers that are relatively prime to n. So what what this is so what what, what this is saying is that uh, mod n <coughs> the order of anything is basically the Lots of weird corollaries. So, so for example, uh, if uh, so say n is a prime, what, what are the uh, what are the totients of the prime? Well, the totients are all of the numbers smaller that are uh, that are relatively prime. That's basically all the numbers less than the prime. So, uh, for, so uh, the the totient function for a prime is just the prime minus one. So I bring any. So if I'm operating mod of prime, anything to a prime minus one power. And this corresponds to, like, when we saw the big exponentiation table, the whole right column was actually all dark. And it's because eventually this thing wraps around. So at some point, we know integer multiplication has to wrap around in a finite field. And, and it turns out that uh, in a prime field, it, it waits as long as possible. It wraps around with order p minus 1. Right? It, and it's p minus 1 instead of p because we lose 0. No zero in there. So all, all the rest of them are per permutations. So if you walk around, I mean, what happens if I walk around, uh, raise it over to a prime power? On a prime field. Oh, I see. You must have. Because the right? You must have hit every single one. Certainly every other one. So you have to add, assuming that prime fields are just permutations of, right, you don't actually end up with them. So, so, uh, so, so, uh, this is actually, uh, for Ma, this Italian mathematician, much, much more famous because he basically never wrote proofs to the theorems. So He'd just be like, here's this awesome theorem. And some were his proofs. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, like like Fermat's last theorem was this uh, basically like there's these uh, uh, perfect triangles, right? Uh, the three, four, five triangle, for example, right? Three square plus four squared, five squared, and uh, 
it turns out there's no perfect cubes like that. Like, you know, some number cube plus some number cube plus some other integer cube, which is no solution. And uh, he, he says, oh, I have an awesome proof of this. <laughs> which he didn't, actually. Because they, they, they proved it in, like, 90s. And so some guys spent, like, 20 years on it. Mathematics. Uh, finally, finally, they got it more or less proof. Actually, he, he like spent seven years proving it, and it presents the proof, and somebody's like, no, 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 this is not going to work. So he has to go and like spend another like half decade <laughs> finding some other way to prove it. So no, uh, it turns out, yeah, there's no, there's no perfect. Uh, uh, I mean, diophantine <coughs> equations, right? These integer equations, very very tricky tricky beasts. So, so here's the deal. Uh, powers in a prime field, right? I, I take anything to a, uh, to a prime power in a prime field. So again, let's see, back to Python. I'm doing a lot of Python. My new favorite language. Uh, so I need a prime like uh, for, for seven. I'm going to take a number. So, so here's a. It's two. I'm going to raise a to the two powers. I'm going to pray. Raise two to the p power mod the prime. I think this is going to be have wrapped around to two again, if I understand this one. Right? Because uh, a to the p minus one is going to be one. Let's multiply both sides by a, and I get back to a again. Hey, wait a sec! Wait a sec! What is the order of p p minus q? What's the multiple unit order? How many times? And what is the quotient function of n? So, what is the quotient function of n? It is what I really need, because I take quotient plus one and I'm there. Right? Ah, so, uh, possible to do this all in one later. Sure. See if we can do this. Okay, so, so, so step one, we, we get uh, Euler's quotient function. Right, quotient. And anything to the totient, pick a number, raise it to the totient, plus one, and we're back to A. This is mod N. So that's that end, that end has to match up. And and you so th this is this is basically just Euler's theorem minus one. So I've added one, so I get back to the original. Right? And this is what we're trying to get. Uh, what does this mean, mod N? I'm, I'm going to do that in, in one second. So here's, here's what I want. So I've got to a, to a to the totion equals 1. This is straight out of uh, uh, Chaos's theorem. Uh, I'm going to raise both sides to the h power. And this is uh, this is a, this is the high entropy sort of part of this proof. So uh, to the h power, let's say any multiple of the totion function, what is that going to end up being? Yeah, well, it's 1 to the h. So it's still going to be 1 mod n. That's a little bit surprising. I now add, I multiply both sides by a, so I get this. This is what I started with the first time, which I started to check done. Plus one equals uh, a. And this looks really a lot like what we're going to try and prove, right? Message raised to some crazy power equals the message. Uh, what what is this? So this. Well, the real question is, what is quotient of n? We built n by multiplying two primes together. N equals p times two. E and q are primes. What's the totient of the prime? So the totient of p is p minus one. Totient of q is q minus one. That's where the p minus one to p minus one is. Uh, well, one of the many properties of totient is the fact that it's multiplicative. Totient of a product is the product of the totient. Totient is a weird word. It, uh, it's apparently supposed to sound like quotient. So if I've got, uh, I guess, uh, so if, if I take two relative primes, these are both prime primes, so we're totally, totally cool. So totient of n equals the totient of p minus 1 times totient of q minus 1. Or, uh, sorry. Totient of n is totient of p times totient of q, which means that uh, that's equal to p minus 1, that's a prime, times q minus 1, because q is a prime. Right. So. Where are we? I can add any number of copies of this totient. 
And then I just have to add one more. What does it sound like? Well, uh, so, so let, let me express this differently. I'm going to say this exponent that I picked, right? So um, call it ED. That's my exponent. It's got to be equal to one mod the quotient. Right. Some number of copies are going to get added. Time, and then I need to end up being equal to one. Like I'm going to raise this to any power, and, and the, the only constraint I have on this power is that it's got to be equal to one. Or I mean, another way to say this: uh, mod totient means this is equal to one plus some multiple of totient. I subtract it off some number. Well, hey, that's how I picked the decryption. Right? My decryption algorithm is I calculate the modular inverse of E mod P minus 1, Q minus 1. And the product has to be 1. That's what. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I start writing this the math way, and, and this says like uh, EV equals one mod the quotient. It doesn't mean take one, apply the mod operator, and then that's it. The mod applies to the whole thing. So this is this is it's probably better to just say uh, when I calculate modular inverse, right? That's that's the the modular part. This is the e minus one, e minus one. And then I, I throw it actually. Uh, you get this out of the uh, the, the extended GCD algorithm that I throw it away. I don't I don't care how many copies of quotient. Uh, so H totally dropped out. Right. Any any number of copies of H, we just we just put this in here. So long story short, this one line, right, modular to the mean to the P minus one P minus one. This is what makes the decryption actually work out. Right? I encrypt the decryption and get back to the rest. Stunned silence. <laughs> of course, I'm through it. I think I'm starting to understand the third line. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so the basic deal, right? Uh, we start with Gauss's. Uh, we start at Gauss, saying, "How does multiplication work in these modular fields?" Yeah. I keep saying Gauss. I, I mean the Euler. Yeah. Yeah. So. Now, how many times do they say Gauss and us? I think three. They're, they're all interchangeable. They're, they're, they were both really fundamental mathematicians, yeah. So o o o Euler's theorem, right? Uh, totient function is this random sort of auxiliary function, right? So, so, so totient function, it's got all these weird properties like multiplicative, multiplicative for numbers that are relative to prime. Uh, the, the, the cool part about totient is it tells you how multiplication, like how, how long multiplication goes until it wraps around. And that's actually what we're using to basically make this all this exponentials we're doing wrap around again modulate n. The surprising fact about n is that if n is a prime, totient is really stupidly simple. It's n minus one. That's not that hard to figure out. So anybody can kind of figure out how multiplication works if n is a prime. If n is not a prime, if n is a composite number that's really hard to factor, it's really hard to compute totient. Or you know. Uh, so if we know how n was constructed, right, we have this sort of secret information about what n is, then we can compute, you know, where multiplication wraps around, where exponentiation wraps around, and nobody else can do that. In fact, it's, it's, it's close to discrete block. The only thing I don't get so far is how you got the one time. 
lots of, let, let, so th there's actually a couple different ways to get there. So, so for example, you can look up in Wikipedia and it says totient is a multiplicative function, right? Meaning totient of a product is the product of the totient. So uh, the thing is, uh, uh, we know how totient works for products, right? It's just, uh, the totient of n equals n minus 1 if n is a product. If n is not a prime, then it's like, well, shoot, I'm not figure it out. Uh, so, so, for example, right, so, so to take a number as a product 2 prime, like 15, you might ask, well, what the heck is totient 15? You can look at them, they have a nice, give you a nice little table with two. Uh, so, yeah, there's an actual table. Yeah, so it, it turns out to to show uh, yeah. So so why is it a okay? So I'm going to take 15. Everything below here that's relatively prime to 15. What is it? Well, it's everything except like three, six, nine, twelve, multiple three, uh, five, ten. Those are those are out too. Everything else is going to be relatively prime. Relatively prime means you don't share a factor. Yeah, greatest compound of is one. So, so 15 is not relatively prime to itself because you divide 15 by 15, divide perfectly. Right? Uh, it, uh, 15 and 12 share this common factor of 3. 15 all these share a common factor of 3. All these share a common factor of 5. Right? But uh, so, so what is what is the uh, what is quotient of 15? Well, quotient of 15. It, it's just like 15 was prime, and all the numbers were going to be in there. Except then, right, we're, uh, we're missing, so uh, we're missing all these multiples of 3 and all these multiples of 5. Right? It turns out there's 5 minus 1 multiples of 3, and 3 minus 1 multiples of 5. So, how come, what do you think? 14 is relatively prime to 15. Yeah. Right. So, so that, that's right. So, so the, um, any number that's the product of two small primes, it's pretty easy to figure out what the, what the value is. If you know what the primes are. If you don't know what the primes are, you're kind of stuck with this deal of like, well, I can count all the I mean, the, the whole trick in crypto has been we just pick numbers big enough you can't count to them, right? You'll just get, you start counting and we'll never really make it there. They're just huge, dang huge. Right? I mean, this is this is not a small number by any means, right? That that's just, that number just goes on. That's that's an enormous prime number. And and this is like the bare minimum size prime. Yeah, but there's definitely yeah. like if I if I do so, so I do 1024 bits on X ray, my message is going to be about 1024 bits. Right? Some big exponential mod this 1024 bit number, it's just going to be a number. Yeah, I guess if I have a really short number, short message to send, it's going to be 1024 bits. Sorry, that, that's going to be kind of a bonus, right? That has extra section. Yeah, yeah. And, and well, and 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 it turns out if you have a number like uh, attack or don't attack, one or zero. You really don't want to send a message of Borga or Borga because, right? They could just they could they could try. Well, I'm just going to try, you know, encrypting with your public key and see if I get a message of attack or not attack. So, so this is actually quite surprising, right? Because you can uh, you can explicitly enumerate all of the possible messages, and if you can explicitly enumerate all the possible messages, you're kind of sunk, right? You have not actually protected this, and you haven't done any encryption at all, which is a little surprising. Uh, so, so the, the, there's actually quite this, right, because it's so easy to encrypt. You can encrypt with nothing but just these public numbers, right? You published n. E is just this constant, right? Anybody can encrypt stuff. So it's, it, this is almost more like a hash. How can you protect data going into a hash? So right, messages like our key are, are passwords. The encryption function is like a hash function. I want to make it so they can't just brute force the hash. You use a salt. So the, the, the typical thing, and uh, I, I didn't, I didn't put this in here. 
it is actually it's considered like laughably insecure. It's just like a fair message to us. There's essentially too much message all leading to zero. What you really want to do is you need to pad the message, and there's an there's official standard ways to do this. The typical standard way to do this is you have like a uh, uh, you say here's the length of the message, the message, and then random crap, and then a little the field at the end of the end part crap. And the crap is designed to be unpredictable. And if you don't have any room for crap, you're not doing it. Surprising, right? This is like the salt that protects a hash, right? a hash password. The, I mean, the, the, the junk in the middle, it's, so, so the deal is, uh, when I encrypt something, it's it's very easy if I have the key, right? So message plus, let's see, be sure to find the crap. And, uh, so, so the deal is, I'm gonna, when I decrypt, I'm going to get blah, 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 garbage. And it's all shifted up here, right? So the high bits are all crap. There's the actual message in the bottom. Now the trick is, it's pretty much impossible to look at this encrypted message and, and reverse engineer what the value is you're trying to send because there's all this chat. So, so, so message padding, utterly critical to being secure on the materials. Uh, th there's, other, there's other really fundamental problems with this thing. So, uh, the way I encrypt data is I just raise it to a power, right? So I get the message, I raise to a power, and then somebody's going to decrypt it. Right? They're raising it to the power that's going to be back to the original message with the wrong again. That's the, the fundamental way this thing operates. What happens if uh, somebody encrypts R times the message? Well, in other words, uh, yeah, uh, how, how, does, how does this work? Well, you know, you just get to B distributes over multiplication. So I'm going to get R times B. And then I, I go ahead and decrypt this and I get R E D, R E D. Hey, we know what exponentiation does. We're back to R times message. Right? Okay. Well, what this means is somebody can separately encrypt R to the E and R to the M uh, and, and M to the E. Then they, then they can multiply them and send them to U and U will decrypt R times M. Multiplicative attack. Because uh, right, if I decrypt that, I'm I'm gonna get that message. So if somebody could take like, so in other words, if uh, if zero is don't attack and one is attack, you're more or less safe. If one means attack and two means uh, don't attack, somebody could just if, if they can intercept your comms again, they could they could actually just transform. They could say we're gonna encrypt a you know, message of two and multiply your whole message by. And then depending on where you, you put the uh, uh, where the message is, right? So we so they can they can affect the low bits, right? Uh, so you take the product things. Then this this again is a place where padding is super duper important. The padding has to be robust to be multiplied. Has to have stuff. It has to have some non-zero bits so that if somebody you know, multiplies it by itself or something. Like that, so, uh, so so yeah. So, so lots of uh, lots of scary things about doing this practice because this is so mathematically simple. It's, it's, it's actually a little bit unbelievable. Uh, here's another weird part about this. This thing, this whole operation is totally computer. So I can take a message, I can raise it to the D, and uh, then anybody can raise that to my public exponent and know that, uh, okay, I got the original message. This is like the opposite of secrecy. Because only I could encrypt this message, but then anybody can decrypt it. That's like the you want it the other way around, right? First, to keep messages secret. When would it be useful to say, I am the only one that could have made this? Anybody can verify it. I am the only one that could have made this. Yeah. So, so actually, what they do, so, so HTTPS, I mean, the, the, uh, the place where they use this, so, so for example, they tell you the algorithm, they tell you the public key, right? There's public key. Uh, they don't tell you the secret key, duh, because uh, right, that, would be, that would be silly and secret. Uh, but what what uh, what happens here, right, is uh, when I look at this guy, this guy's signature. So let's see, somewhere here is the signature value. There's a signature value. This is basically it's a, a cryptographically signed copy of the hash of the whole certificate so far. So, so the, the, the hash says like. Uh, all this stuff is right, that durable message. Nobody can change that message by changing the function. And then they take that, they cryptographically signed it with their private key. And then you can you can check the signature right, by decrypting it. 
and if you get the hash again, you're like awesome. Uh, and uh, so, so, so the trick here is that everything for decryption is now public, meaning anybody can check the check the signature, but uh, only you can sign it as long as you can keep the credit key private. Question. This is still your private key. And you can actually use this for both things at once, so it's probably a little scarier. People can encrypt and then I'll be decrypted. Yeah. And you can encrypt anybody who has the public. They know you can do that. That keeps them protected. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, uh, so 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 they call it so this is so this is known as a uh, encrypted key. And it's uh, so 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 they call so this is so this is known as a uh, so, so you encrypt and decrypt. Or here you will sign and then verify. So sign and then so you, you verify the signature that, hey, yeah, this thing uh, actually matches what they do, or is the encrypt and decrypt. The, the encrypt decrypt, it's, it's semi-useful maybe for, like, you uh, you just connect with the web server. You will maybe, you will uh, uh, make up a private key, like the session key that we're going to use to talk about with some faster problem, uh, and, and then basically uh, uh, I will encrypt it, send it to them, only they can decrypt it. Right? They will do the same thing that I have, but so we can come into the key store. Especially as a person else, although you're public key. Mm -hmm. You can say, if you want to send me yeah. a message and no one else can read, yeah. send exactly. me with this public key. Right. Right. And only I will ever yeah. receive it. Yeah. So. So, uh, so encryption, decryption, signature verification. And, and these are literally just going to serve opposite operations of each other. I mean, this provides perfect security, perfect secrecy. But the thing is, you have no idea who really sent you this message. Right? It's just the phone there, and it's like, well, there it is. Uh, the signature provides perfect authentication. Right? And I know they're the only ones that could possibly send this thing. But, uh, but I don't actually get any, uh, I, I don't get any, uh, any authentication. Right. If, what if you want both? In other words, I'm communicating with Mike, and I want to know uh, no one can read the messages I'm sending again. And there's, I, I, so I'm going to do that by uh, I'm going to encrypt them with uh, his public key. But I also want him to know that I'm the only one who can send it to him. So I will sign them. Sign, sign your yeah. record. Yeah. And and, uh, and then of course you know we each have a modulus and an encryption. So you have to practice that. So you, you, you could you could do it in, in lots of different ways. Like if you want to publicize the fact that you're sending messages to Mike, like for a contract, right? then you might you know sign the uh, past. Uh, and uh, if you want to keep the fact that you're sending messages to Mike, but uh, it's not you don't want to publicize the fact that you're you're signing. Yeah, so, so lots of cool options. This is used all over the place for, I mean, this is sort of the, in fact, this is about the only way, ways to keep information both public, but right, saying, like, anybody, you know, can verify that this thing will pay. Right, right, so, so, I mean, HTTPS, the whole, the whole way this, this operates, anybody can look at a HTTPS certificate and verify that, uh, yep, unless uh, somebody broke into global sign. You know, which happens all the time, unfortunately. Uh, then, and and, and, uh, and the really scary part is, it's it's actually kind of hard to tell how many of these you know root keys just the a list. Um, it, it, pretty much every web browser accepts like literally a hundred root certificates, right? But like, well, certainly none of these hundred organizations can actually like. You know, what would be the alternative? I mean, what would be the obvious thing? Like, we want to just make sure this is really. Uh, be secure. But one key makes the whole internet work. Right? And then, like, we have one organization that's in charge of keeping that key secret, and then they can sign, like, you know, for, for any of these hundred people, and then, and then you know, nobody can uh, oh, What organization would that be? If you say the U.S. government, unfortunately, <laughs> most people, most countries are not willing to. North Korea. Yeah. <laughs> The UN, Microsoft. Anybody can make up their own. I mean, it's it's really easy to generate public keys, private keys. So, so it turns out you do this on the command line. You do this with uh, some a little tiny bit of. Uh, oh, we never talked about pocket pocket. Okay. Pocket. 
there's a really easy version of prime planning, which unfortunately is really quick and dirty. Uh, that's to do this. I know if W is prime, take any number and raise the grade to the prime minus one power of prime, that's guaranteed to be one. Turns out the converse doesn't quite hold. So I can so, so the typical way to make random primes. I'm amazed by this. You get some random bits. You make sure they're not odd. You make sure they're odd. Right? Uh, I, I I have to make sure they're they're relatively big. I check the greatest common denominator with 65, 5, 3, 7, because otherwise that's, that's a disaster. I check to see if they're a Fermat prime by just again right, raising a bunch of numbers. If I get one, then maybe it's prime. If I get anything other than one, this was not a prime. So two. Again, this is a frustrating case where we have we have an, a, an easy algorithm that if it's uh, uh, if we get uh, if we get any number other than one, it's composite, guaranteed. So they call that a witness number, right? This number will will, will attest to the fact that that guy is not prime. Now the problem is if you get hard to find witnesses, like uh, you might have, uh, so, uh, for example, worst witness ever, one. He, he claims everybody's prime, right? He will never tell you a number is positive. Why? Because he thinks one or any power on anything. It's one. What information did you get from that? Virtually none. Right. So one terrible witness. Uh, so, so what's surprising about this is uh, you, so you're looking, you're canvassing numbers for witnesses. How do you that just randomly generate? If I randomly generate bits uh, to make the primes and to make the witnesses. Uh, if that's a pseudo random number generator, which primes am I going to end up with? The same ones every time. But this has been a recurring problem. So when I say random, I get random bits. I'm actually using the so Perl has a basically a new random source system random, and hopefully it actually works. I mean, so, so if I run this thing again, I should get different primes. Seven four nine. Now it's six five four. And, and Running it again doesn't really guarantee much anything, but uh, suppose according to documentation, what that's for. You do that. So, so it turns out, so I can I can test from uh, use the Fermat prime number test, and the only problem is there's these numbers called Carmichael numbers, which uh, no one will testify against them, which is really weird. They sound that sounds fishy somehow. All the witnesses, all the potential witnesses, are actually liars. There's, they, it, it happens that Carmichael numbers have a multiplicative order that's equal to the number minus one. Ah, no, uh, that's that's not even true. Is it? Uh, I think I think it's like the second time you hit one or something. Or the third time you hit one it makes it a number. But the deal is right. I, I raise it to the w minus one power mod w, and I get I always get one. So so step one is the Fermat test, and then the other one, and it's the miller rabin prime number test. And I pretty much type this in straight out of uh, the official government book of how to pick uh, prime numbers. I don't know if I should really be trusting that, but it's certainly more trustworthy than something. So here's here's basically the idea. This looks a lot like a Fermat test. Apparently, you can end up with w minus one. It seems to be about 50 50, from what I can tell. And then, uh, if it's other than plus one or minus one, in which case it hasn't basically told, it hasn't told you it's false, then there's a couple of energies that you may need to check depending on uh, uh, basically how odd the thing is. So, for example, if it's uh, you, you've actually picked a power of two that divides w minus one, subtracted that out of there to make this number n. W minus one is two to the a minus m, or two, two to the a times m. So, for example, if it's if, have you heard of this like multiplicity of oddness? If I have like a number that's odd, but you subtract one, and, uh, and clearly it's going to be even. If I divide by two, that by two, and it turns out to be odd again, then it's sort of got more oddness. Uh, a power of 2 minus 1 is odd a little, but not that odd. <laughs> power of 2 plus 1, right? Uh, so, so, you can, so you can you can check these things. So, so the, the, there's there's this different test, right? So I, I, I can do incremental squaring to uh, to account for those things. And so, so supposedly this test, uh, statistically, they say that uh, 3 out of 4 composite numbers fail each round of the test. So if I just repeat the test, you know, n times, and they recommend uh, 64, 
you're actually at 2 to the minus 128 probability that uh, it was actually gone. Which is pretty good. So, they, they call these industrial strength primes. They're not actually mathematically primed. It, it turns out, so this is kind of surprising. Verifying that your 512 bit number is actually primed is a pretty expensive operation. Usually, people are not willing to go through that. Uh, so it's, as long as it's not like or something, then it's uh, more or less. Hopefully, they're counting that you can, you can actually, and there's a, again the NIST document gives you a way to prove this stuff. And and you're you're actually you're a little bit more up here because you are you're using half the number of bits for each one, which means that you're you know, you're way ahead in the asymptotics, right? So we, we can actually verify formality of control with numbers with you know, some computational expense. There. 2048 bit is I think undoable at this point, but I can generate random you know 1496 bit uh, modulus p and then. I can I can I can run these tests. It, uh, I mean, it, it's it, there's something a little bit hinky about saying like, what is the probability this number is prime? That's back to the old definition of probability, right? Like, it's either prime or it's not. It's not like a you know, well maybe, right? Or like uh, the, the, the first interesting question I think is to say if we generate a bunch of numbers using this protocol, what fraction of them turned out to be composite? And then you know, you look mathematics on that. It's it's a small number of the right tests. So. Yeah, so, so, so we have these sort of increasingly hinky uh, uh, tests to uh, perform that. There, there's, there's way more math here than really I can relate to. I want to find out what is the prime modulus. I want to be able to generate n. Prime n seems like it should be very simple. I'm sure I'm sure we'll look at it for five minutes and see. Uh, you should definitely work on your project. So we got, what, two weeks or something? Yeah, so rough drafts are definitely becoming due. I should I should give you some homeworks. This is actually this stuff is great for homework. So I should, uh, so I should keep your eyes peeled for that. I'll try and get that done. Should be prop setting every weekend. <laughs> that will be got done at some future date. Keep your eye on the website for that. Uh, thanks thanks for coming in. Thanks for calling in. Um,